I must say that I'm very excited and happy that the idea that Mark and I had in Scotland has uh, sort of come to fruition. Uh, this is a session that we're very excited about and we're hoping that it will sort of continue, the discussion will continue in uh, the EA meetings that, uh, you know, going, going forward. Um, my paper is going to be a little bit different on my presentation. I'm not going to be talking so much about the reconstruction process as some of the experience that we've had at the Archaeological Institute of America with people using reconstructions, in, in, especially in sort of an outreach and a community, community engagement manner. But um, So that's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to focus on process as much. Um, but let me start with uh, a quick anecdote. Uh, I work in the Maya area in Mesoamerica. Uh, Maya, the Maya used to build houses on uh, either earthen or stone mounds. So wooden houses on earthen or stone mounds. So by the time the archaeologists come into the scene, of course, the wood is gone, the thatch is gone, and what we have are mounds. Since it's not uncommon, uh, and, you know, for us it's second nature working in that area. Uh, years ago I was giving a lecture, and you know, I thought I'd given a brilliant lecture on Maya architecture. <laughs> explaining everything, layout, settlement, choices. At the end of it, the question came, I mean, I asked, opened up a question. So the first question was, so are the structures behind those mounds or under the mounds? And I was like, ah, it's second like nature. I mean, for us, looking yeah. at a plan view or a stratigraphic profile, creating three-dimensional space from a two-dimensional plan becomes second nature. For most people, it isn't, and I guess I didn't realize that. It should be. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's... <laughs> there is therefore the need for us to interpret these sites and what we realized just sort of looking around and doing basic sort of surveys sites that have some sort of reconstruction doesn't have to be wholly reconstructed even partial reconstruction or images or something those sites are better understood and better received by visitors than things that have no uh, nothing explanatory in that sense um, so that's the basis for what uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit, but what I'm going to use is just sort of case studies from a program uh, that we set up at the AIA, uh, a site preservation program, uh, and just talk a few about some of the experiences that we've had and, and, and some of the ways that people are using these uh, reconstructions. We initiated the site preservation program in 2007, uh, and I think we sort of, when we first thought of it, we formulated it as a fairly typical conservation reconstruction restoration type project. Uh, and we, our first two grants went to a site in Turkey, Asos, uh, and Easter Island, a project on Easter Island. Uh, Asos, this is the temple, or what's left of the temple of Athena. Uh, it was originally the temple built, I think, in the sixth century BC. Uh, was, uh, it's built with locally available stone and a site. Uh, but in the 90s, they did a reconstruction that used concrete. Uh, and so they reconstruct some of the columns of these concrete pieces. Uh, by the 2000s, the concrete was dissolving and deteriorating terribly. Uh, so we funded a project that actually went back, took original, uh, took local andesite, used local stone workers to recreate the columns, build them in the correct sort of tapered form that they needed to be, and reset it. So um, this is just images that illustrate the process. Uh, you know. Uh, Again, local workers, local stone, the actual stone that would have been used in the temple originally. Uh, and by the end of it, we had uh, a reconstructed corner of the temple with about four columns. That's great, but it's four columns in a temple on a site in Turkey that if you don't actually get to, you don't see, you don't experience. Uh, and so for us, we sort of had to sit back and evaluate this after we gave the two projects. There were, there were several issues. One. These were really expensive projects. We do this kind of conservation reconstruction. It's pricey. I think we gave them close to $200,000. All the money that we raise for this grant program is privately raised. We raise it from donors. So there's only so much money that we can raise at any time. Two of our projects nearly wiped out half the budget that we had raised for this project. And so now we, and so, so it's expensive. The impact, so the AI is, is, it does a lot of outreach, magazines, journals, um, out in educational programs, lecture programs. And so we try to evaluate the impact of a program like this. While what we did, I think, was justified, reasonable, 
did a great you know, service to something that had been sort of misinterpreted and mis you know, badly regressed in the past. For us as an organization, for the kind of investment that we had made in this, the impact of it seemed fairly limited. Um, so we rethought our process and we said, okay, instead of doing sort of more traditional conservation projects, would we, and again, remember the AI is not a conservation organization. That's just one part of, of many things that we do. Uh, and so we felt that our strength didn't lie in supporting these sort of projects, but instead we took a step back and said, you know what, our strength is getting people together, facilitating you know, discussion, facilitating outreach, uh, and, and sort of supporting people in the work that they are doing, uh, and, and, and using site preservation as one component of that sort of outreach work that they're doing. So we actually decided to stop funding traditional sort of brick and mortar conservation projects and instead started looking for holistic projects that would take conservation as one element of a much larger outreach process, an engagement process, especially with local communities. Uh, and I can talk about this after if there are questions, I can give you details on this project. But that was the basic idea. We looked for these sort of holistic projects that included outreach engagement uh, with uh, the, the, the conservation. Um, since that point, we have support. I think there are about 30 projects that we're currently uh, supporting. Uh, and the grants are much smaller, by the way. The maximum the grant that we give now is about $25,000. So it's sort of, uh, instead of taking uh, the money and spreading it, I mean, just get, funding a few projects, we now have an opportunity to influence a lot, I mean, to, to sort of support many more projects with the kind of grants that we're giving. So under the new plan, uh, one of the first projects we did, uh, or we supported, was in Umal Jamal, Jordan. Umal Jamal is a site that was probably set up by people from Petra. It sort of lies between Petra and Damascus, so part of that trade route. I think that's sort of where we get the, and the origins of uh, uh, Umal Jamal. It goes from about the 1st century to 8th century AD. The, 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 and this is the site, the picture of the site. But what we did, at the, or what we supported at this site, was a project that talked about essentially creating a virtual museum. Uh, and along with that, start linking it to a curriculum that now is part of the Jordanian school system. So it's sort of maximum multiple impacts. Uh, and uh, again, uh, something that was much more easy to support a complete project like this that could deal with the site as a whole as opposed to, say, one corner of a temple at a site. Now again, I have nothing, I mean, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be done. I'm just saying for an organization like that, it didn't seem feasible to continue supporting by that. So this is what we've done. This, the virtual museum is now up. Uh, people can uh, look at, you can take a virtual walkthrough of the site. This is not new technology. Uh, it's not, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with things like this. It's just the fact that they were able to do this for a site that's relatively under visited. I mean, if you go to Jordan, you go to Petra. Uh, and most people go to Petra and they leave, or they do some shopping. Uh, but there are a lot of other sites, Umul Jamal being one of them. Since they've got the site of the virtual exhibit, they've had visitors from about 85 different countries. Uh, you know, about 100 sites have linked to them. And so that, I think, the, the, what the site is, the history of the site, I think, is now uh, a little bit more accessible. Uh, and one of the cool things that they did was, in addition to doing the virtual museum and usually having the artifacts and the site reconstruction things, they also had local people interviewed and gave stories about what the site meant to them, you know, in their lifetime, and also sort of their kind of parents and grandparents' experience. And so, it kind of makes the whole thing, I think, a little bit more alive. Uh, that's the museum. Uh, so that was one project in Umal Jamal in Kisunerga, Cyprus. Slightly different thing. In this case, what they wanted to do was a reconstruction of a calculithic house. Uh, the calculithic in Cyprus is, I guess, severely underrepresented. Most people don't really think about the calculithic. So what they did was they, you know, and they had a spectacular find. This is one of the largest calculithic structures I think ever found on Cyprus. It's about nine meters across. Uh, and it, uh, because of certain circumstances, uh, I think it, uh, there was a fairly massive fire that kind of burnt the place but preserved a lot of the artifacts. So they have something like 280 pithoi from this uh, and a bunch of stone tools. So what they wanted to do was do a, re a reconstruction, a physical re uh, a replica, sorry, uh, of the roundhouse and connect that with a virtual recreation of the interior that would be accessible uh, online and put back all the artifacts that they had found in situ within the virtual reconstruction. So that's what they did here. 
So here's the reconstruction process that actually done with local workers, uh, field school students, but one of the things that we thought was really interesting, which they had proposed, was they made it this actually a community process. So everything sort of organized and uh, prepared, but then they invited the community to come in and actually help with the mud creation, the clay creation, uh, and then had them help sort of plaster the walls. And, and the, we talked to the site director after this project, and she said that this was sort of a life-changing event for most of the people who had come, and the kids especially, who now felt like not just that they understood the history a little better, but they felt like they were part of the creation of this sort of historic site and for the presentation of it. And so this was something that we thought was an interesting element, this sort of what I would almost call particip participatory reconstruction. So here's the interior, just to show what they did with it. Uh, here are the artifacts and So uh, third project, so I'm just going to talk about two more. This one, one more. Um, Payne's Creek in Belize. Payne's Creek in Belize is an underwater site. Well, the site that's it's been submerged. Uh, it's famous, or it's now notorious, for the fact that they found wooden structures. This is the area that I work in. This is, in fact, where I did all my doctoral work. I'm not a pain scrape in Belize. Uh, it is hot, humid, tropical, acidic soils, wood, bone, none of this preserves. When we work on human, on human burials, it looks great on the ground. As soon as you touch the bone or remove it, it just crumbles. Organic material is incredibly hard to come by. There are sunken, I mean, there are wooden posts from the house underneath over here in the water. Uh, there are preserved posts in their original post holes from the original buildings that are just that are still preserved at, uh, at the site. But the, sort of the more uh, interesting, or that that is great, but you have to be at the site to be able to see those. And the problem is that the more people come to the site, the, the worse for the site itself, the preservation of those things. So actually, we're trying to restrict access to that. They're kind of building a little bit of a cordon around it and trying to build a viewing platform so you can actually see from the surface without uh, impacting the water. But the major discovery there was a wooden paddle. Uh, the wooden paddle, uh, which has never been found in the Maya area, uh, made from a local wood. It's about four feet, seven inches. That's the original. They made a 3D replica of it, and then they got a local craftsman to make an actual paddle. This has become an outreach object. And it's amazing to see the kind of reaction people have to seeing this paddle. This has been toured around the country, and it's all very fancy <laughs> openings. That's the, that's the official opening at that. Helen McKillop, by the way, is the, is the archaeologist who led the project. That's the official opening at the city close to the site, the site called Punta Gorda. They have a, a new exhibit there. That's the opening. This is an official presentation to the directors of the, of the Institute of Archaeology in Belize. That's local media, uh, you know, like a very fair, popular radio talk show host. And they, so they made this a big, everywhere it went, it was received like a rock star. I mean, there were people, I mean, I think it was sort of material, culture, you could touch it. And it was unique, never been found before, and people just sort of rallied around. So now they have an exhibit, they have lectures, and she teaches in Louisiana. They had an event in Louisiana during the hurricanes, Rita, and, uh, and, and there were still about 100 people who showed up to see the wooden paddle, a 1,300-year-old wooden paddle. So it's that kind of an impact that these, these objects can have. Uh, so that's what they're doing in Belize. Here's the, the exhibit. Uh, this, by the way, up until that point, it actually still is, this had been the most famous object from Belize. This is a 10-pound jade head, the largest piece of jade ever found in Mesoamerica. It's the uh, image of the sun god, Kinichahau, uh, and it's in the, you know, this is Belize's most prized ancient object. The paddle, the wooden paddle, that some incompetent paddler lost, no, uh, you know, is now rivaling the jade head. Uh, which uh, I, I mean, I find amazing, but you know. Uh, last project I want to talk about Guatemala, San Bartolo, uh, another sort of virtual, virtual participatory project. This is a site where they have found some of the most incredible Maya murals uh, from very early, uh, and uh, in a pyramid. Um, that's the that's the pyramid itself. The tunnel that they had to dig is actually a looter's tunnel. Uh, and the, the, the archaeologist who found this was actually taking a break in the shade uh, because of the hot and happened to look up at the wall and, and find the murals. Um, that's what it looks like now. Uh, but one of the things that they're doing here is uh, 3D scanning and recreating all these objects, and they're going to be putting it up online. And a visitor can actually help them refit it. 
uh, and, and sort of play with the things so they can create a, a, a sort of virtual jigsaw puzzle, but it's actually helping them with their interpretation because there are just thousands of these pieces. Uh, part of this is that there's a series of murals and, ser and, and series of structures, uh, and when the new structure was built, the old one was ritually destroyed, and uh, the mural sort of fragments were spread across the floor. So now we have all these sort of mixed fragments which they're trying to reconstruct, uh, and they're letting actually, to, virtually, uh, you, can, you can sort of help them with their research. So uh, just, and I'm going to stop there, just to say, um, again, reconstruction, we, we discuss it a lot in, you know, in the cases of reconstruction after warfare, of natural deterioration, absolutely. But even when sites are not threatened in that same way or haven't been destroyed, there's such a, a need for reconstruction, interpretation, and also in terms of getting this kind of community engagement. Uh, in, 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 in having people feel like they're part of what's coming to alive uh, at the archaeological site. Right, I'll stop there. <laughs>